Well, hello, hello, my lovelies. Welcome to another episode of Ginger Arky. I am your host, Trisha Stewart Mann, and I have an awesome guest today. I think some of you guys probably know her pretty well. This is Miss Hannah Cox. How are you, Hannah? I'm good. Good to be here. Um, so Hannah is a, somebody that is called a libertarian conservative. Um, and real quick, Hannah, how would you describe a libertarian conservative? What uh, makes you stand out rather than a traditional conservative or a paleo conservative? Yeah, you know, it's a term I've been using for a while. And to be honest, I feel like increasingly as conservatism has moved sin significantly in this country, I consider myself less and less of a conservative. But for a long time, I was running a conservative organization. I was working with a lot of conservatives and, and I felt like that was a more accurate um, description of, of where I was. I, cer I certainly don't lean into like anarchy. And so that's something that I can get some heat from, from certain libertarian circles, but I am an extremely limited government person. You know, I believe in a very limited state. I'm really kind of, um, of the mindset of the framers of our constitution. I think we should have a court system. I think that the government needs to run that, at, you know, as, as problematic as it is. And I think we're going to talk about that today. I don't think that it should be, uh, something that is controlled by free market incentives. So that's actually one area that I don't think the market should be in control of. Um, I think we need a, a limited military, certainly nothing like what we have now um, and so I have a few you know areas where I think government should be involved but they are much more limited than the average person and certainly much more limited than your average conservative these days so libertarian conservative but increasingly much more libertarian yes I was gonna say you know I follow you and I've listened to some of your shows and your interviews and I would say you're basically probably just a libertarian in my mind <laughs> although I guess you can throw out labels and I am personally an anarchist but I've been called not a real anarchist before too so <laughs> I don't think anybody's a real anything right so. <laughs> exactly. and, you know, I think it doesn't really matter like I'm somebody who doesn't really care very much about labels or parties I care about principles and how we apply those principles so I think um you know labeling people can be helpful at, at, at sometimes but also can be harmful because it sort of gives people an excuse to kind of just write you off like I do think if I branded myself as a libertarian there would be a lot of conservatives that quit listening to me and that's problematic that's a problem in our society where we don't want to listen to people who aren't part of our tribe or our group. And, and I really hate that facet of, of our discourse. It, it's funny because this comes up a lot when I interview people or we just have conversations. There's so much fighting in, in libertarianism and there's like four of us. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we should stop doing that and see where we can get along. Um, and everybody starts somewhere. So I like what you said about conservatives too, because I grew up very conservative, um, politically active worked a little bit for the Republican Party. Um, and so I think you had somewhat of a similar uh, upbringing. I know that you you're, um, were raised, your PK, pastor's kid? I'm a PK, yeah, yes. Southern Baptist, pastor's kid. <laughs> so what was that journey like for you? Like, were you conservative, not interested in politics? Yeah, I think I was sort of, I don't know, I, I often say I was kind of like not thinking that deeply about it until I really started to move into politics, which was in my early to mid 20s. But I, I think in fairness, I probably did think about it more than the average American now that I've spent more time in, in more circles. My, my family was pretty active and engaged. I had a great education. They were, you know, sort of, of like the Marco Rubio, George Bush kind of vein of Republicans. So I was kind of a little neocon. I thought that, you know, we needed to be in all these wars. And I loved John McCain in college, which is so embarrassing to me now. And um, so I, I kind of really hadn't thought much more deeply outside of uh, the Republican Party, but I will say that even as a young child, I had really strong libertarian leanings that really broke with my family. I was always adamantly gay marriage. I remember that being a huge contention point when I was in middle school and like my family couldn't believe that I was pro-gay marriage and I could not believe that they weren't. And so I always kind of had these areas where I was more socially left, I think, and, and really more libertarian. Um, and so I just didn't really have a word for that. And when I got into the political field, I started working on the side when I was still in music, I, I really started encountering a much broader swath of the Republican Party. I was speaking at Tea Party meetings and I started hearing a lot of things that were new to me, you know, anti-immigrant sentiments, anti-Muslim sentiments. And so even though I'd grown up in like a very conservative Southern Baptist home, my family really was not of that vein. They were not populist. They were not um, people who looked down on other people. Even in their anti-gay marriage sentiments, they weren't 
bigoted in that they just had really strong religious beliefs. And so um, that was foreign to me. And it really sort of shocked me and pushed me back and made me think, I don't know that I am a Republican, if this is what Republican is, and maybe I need to go figure out a bit more concretely what I believe and why I believe. And so it was kind of in that process that I learned what a libertarian was, and, and really more importantly, got a better education in free market economics and, and really started to define my principles outside of a political ideology. Um, free market economics. So a lot of people might find that really boring. I personally find it very interesting as well. Yes. So there are female economic nerds out there. <laughs> um, and I do think that kind of puts you down the road to libertarianism if you're conservative, because it's a natural progression. Um, you know, if you believe in free market principles, I don't particularly think a lot of conservatives actually follow that belief in the way that they act politically. So what issues do you find like maybe with um, a Republican who would espouse free market principles and then what um, say the last administration was doing as far as as far as the uh, economy? Yeah, there's a lot of confusion, I think. I think free markets and capitalism are buzzwords that the Republican Party loves to throw around and use. And, and I was also somebody you know, who was in this camp that just sort of trusted them. I believe that's what they were doing. And I didn't have a strong enough economic understanding to recognize when they broke with that, right? So um, I did get into economics. And you know, it's funny, I never thought I would be into econ. I don't like math. And to me, it was like this very math nerdy tech kind of subject. Yeah. But really, if you study free market economics, it's the study of people, it's the study of, of human action. Action. It's, it's actually something that if you're into psychology and sociology, I think you'll gravitate towards and, and find that it's much more accessible than it probably sounds on the, on the offset. And that was the case for me. And as I got deeper and deeper into it, I was then able to start watching the votes, especially at the state level where I was working. And, you know, all of a sudden recognize like these guys aren't actually supporting free market economics at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're voting for really big government infringement into the market and, and nobody bats an eye. And, and I really do think that's because people are just simply not educated. I know I was having a discussion around Trump with a family member last year who, who was surprised I wasn't going to vote for Trump. They said, but you know, maybe you don't like some of these other things he's doing, but he's the closest thing to what you believe. And I was like, he's, he's really not like, he's as far <laughs> away from what I believe as Joe Biden is like we there's, yeah, I can't tell you the difference, like honestly. And he said, well, he's, he supports free markets. And I was like, no, he does not support free markets. And it was this, you know, this huge thing where I don't think people understand, aside from just the spending, which under Trump was atrocious, you know, things like trade wars and tariffs and immigration mm -hmm. controls, these are anti-free market, anti-capitalism stances. These are things that actually infringe on the buying and selling choices that ought to just be between the two people making those interactions. And instead, the government's coming in and setting quotas and controls and all kinds of like hoops that people have to jump through and they're picking winners and losers losers and they're giving, you know, handouts to some people and bailouts to others. And there's a lot of cronyism. Um, and, and we saw just as much of that under Trump as we have any Democrat administration. Um, and, and we saw it under Bush and we saw it under Reagan. And, and really, if you start to understand these principles, once you start looking back at these administrations, you start to recognize that um, I love the Tom Woods quote that says you vote and you vote and you vote, but you just get John McCain. John McCain. <laughs> yes. And you do. And I know a lot of Democrats who feel the same way, especially when it comes to things like war and civil liberties, like no matter what these people tell you, they get in office and they're not actually standing by these mm -hmm. things. So um, I, I really do wish that more Americans had time to pay attention to what's going on behind the scenes and not just listen to the talking points because they say one thing and do another. But I think also it's important that people have a better grasp of those principles so that they can tell when the parties aren't actually measuring up to them. Um, so as far as free market principles, a lot of people would argue that um, border control is important. Um, in order to keep, you know, entitlement programs spending down, things like that. But actually, through um, free market principles and, and economists that I've studied, uh, more of an open border system, or at least a very uh, uh, immigration system that would be easier for people to get through, would actually be more in line with free markets. What do you think about that? Yeah, to me, this was something when it first started coming up that really surprised me. I've always been very pro-immigrant. I like immigrants first and foremost. Um, I, you know, as somebody who's not even that deep of a math person, it's a pretty basic dollars and cents calculation. Immigrants are net positive for our economy. They they are such a benefit to us. And it's amazing that we have a country where people want to come. You know, there's so many places that people are trying to get out of, and that's a destinance for a country and for an economy. Um, so to me, I was surprised when that sentiment started coming up. And as far as like tracing it back to a principle, you know, even from like eighth grade reading of Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, which so much of our economy has been based on, you know, there's a basic economic principle that says 
free movements are a necessary component of a free market. You can't have a free market if you don't have the choice to hire who you want. If there isn't real competition among workers, being able to drive prices and drive salaries. And so I, I really was just a little shocked and taken aback to see that sentiment come out in the Republican party. I, I, I really think it does come from a xenophobic place and just a total lack of econ understanding. It's, it's a very negative attitude and something that's really driven me pretty quickly um, away from that movement, you know, more so than anything else, because I just disagree with it on both an economics front and on a moral front. Um, I have a huge issue with it, but, you know, I think it's funny when people say that we, we can't have open immigration because of the welfare system. Well, we've had a really strict immigration system for decades, and I haven't seen anybody take a penny out of the welfare system. So that's not working so well to actually reduce entitlements. Maybe if we were to open the borders, there'd be more incentive for us to start to claw back some of that. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of people, you know, their argument will be, you know, well, if you're just going to let anybody in, let them into your home. And libertarians absolutely believe in borders. They just believe in private ones. <laughs> yeah, I would also so. love the opportunity to, to open my home to immigrants. You yeah. know, Canada has a program where you can bring refugees in your home. We often don't. We make it really hard for people to do that, even for us to sponsor families and bring them here. There's a lot of Americans who would love to do that. So mm -hmm. I think it's really stupid when they say that line. Um, but furthermore, you know, I, I don't know that I'm somebody who's an, a no borders person. And mm -hmm. I think that's a really big difference between saying no borders versus open borders. I think, you know, you can have an open border system where people can move about and live and work and, and seek safety and resources and basic employment, even without giving them citizenship, right? It doesn't have to mean that people then get to vote or have access to entitlements, et cetera. Uh, we know from the data that immigrants are far less likely to be dependent on those things anyways than, than native born Americans. They tend to be very industrious, hardworking people. Um, but as a whole, I, I think that you could have an open border system that, that doesn't necessarily give all of the benefits of citizenship to somebody. It's more important that we have the ability for people to move about. And I would hope that during COVID, where so many people had that right taken from them and mm -hmm. they were shut in their homes, that that would all of a sudden um, make them a bit more aware of how that is a human right to be able to seek safety and and, and resources and to go where, where you um, need to be in, in certain times of crisis. I know for me it was because I was in New York City when COVID hit and the ability to leave mm -hmm. New York and go to South Carolina where my family was, was a huge deal. That's scary too. Um, you know, being there, did you feel like you were almost going to get stuck in New York in like some, yeah. some sort of like movie type of situation yes. where you couldn't get out? Oh. Yeah. My best friend, I have my best friend in the world lives in New York city and I had a few other friends, but I hadn't been there very long. I had just relocated about four months before COVID hit. I had a six month sublease. So I was kind of trying to stick it out and see like what was going to happen. And I remember the first month we hunkered down the city just emptied. There was nobody around, which is, it's a very eerie feeling in New York. You know, there's safety in numbers yeah. and all of a sudden the streets are empty. There's nobody around. And so we went, she had a high rise. I had more of a brownstone. So we stayed in the high rise. We felt safer there. There was a dorm in there. Um, but we were really afraid and, and we kept hearing every day, you know, uh, Cuomo was coming on and giving his speeches and there were all these rumors that they were going to shut the borders, um, that you wouldn't be able to fly out. And I remember she and I both kept a flight booked every day, just in case we needed to get out. And we were mm -hmm. constantly watching it and just trying to pay attention to what was happening. But it was very scary. You know, the idea that you might not be able to leave. Um, and, and the fact that you would have been stuck in New York city, where to be frank, you couldn't get things that you needed. People were dying on hospital floors because of mismanagement of the hospital system. There was a body truck outside my door where they were putting bodies because they couldn't bury them fast enough. Um, so it was a situation where you might not be able to get basic medical care if you needed it in this city. And so to think that you might be trapped there was really quite terrifying. What was the final straw where you said, I'm getting out? Well, as my sublease was ending, I'd been there um, two months at that point and there was no end in sight. <laughs> you know, there was there was no um, foreseeable time where there was not going to be a mass mandate where businesses could open back up. Um, fortunately for me, you know, I was in a situation where I didn't have a full lease. I hadn't actually moved all my furniture. So it was easier for me to get out than it would have been had I had those sort of things tying me there. Um, so when my sublease was up, I decided not to sign another apartment lease. And I basically put a bunch of stuff in storage at a friend's house in Connecticut and sh shipped one box home and packed a bag and like went through LaGuardia. I was the only person in LaGuardia, got on a flight and got out of there. And it was, it was pretty scary. Um, and I, I was really glad, you know, and thankful that again, I had the ability and I had a family who was, you know, more than fine with me coming home and, and crashing there for a few months until I figured out my next move.
flying was my husband and I, uh, I remember we were down for um, in Memphis and we were flying back the day everything started closing. And it was just so eerie to like have left when everything was booming and come back to that empty airport. It really looks like something like escape from LA or in your case, escape from New York. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have pictures of like Times Square, just empty, just yeah. totally empty. And I That's remember insane. feeling like this feels like the end of the world. It was, it was so weird. It's really heartbreaking though, if you think about it. I mean, just everything the lockdowns have done and there's there's so much that everybody's excited to get back and do things again. But I just think of all those people that their businesses are never gonna reopen. Like I know people, I lost two, two jobs personally um, through that. And it's just, we can all be excited and celebrate, but at the same time, there's people who took blows in their future, their financial future, their retirement that it's gonna take them years to recover from. Yeah. That's exactly right. Um, so, oh, I did read another thing about you and you do keto. <laughs> well, I did do keto. I now just do a very low carb version of keto okay. because to be honest, keto is great. It's, a, it's yeah. a wonderful diet. And, um, I did it when I got home last year, I wanted to lose some weight, but also my dad is type two diabetic and just sneaks off and eats Dunkin' Donuts all the time. So I thought I'm going to get this house in order. Yeah. <laughs> so I put us both on keto and I was, and I love, I love keto because you can find a replicate um, recipe for anything you want. Like Pretty it much. never really feels like you're missing out. We both lost a lot of weight. His numbers were back into normal territory within like a month. It was phenomenal, awesome. but I quit doing it um, hardcore because my hair started falling out like in clumps. <laughs> and apparently that's kind of normal because um, keto, it, it's changing your processes in your body. And so it, it kind of has like the impact that a major surgery would have of, of the stress that your body undergoes. So people will get breakouts or they'll lose their hair or they'll have all kinds of other issues. And I'm a little vain about my hair. So the minute that started happening, I was like, this is not going to work. Yana, I wouldn't know <laughs> anything about being vain about your hair. My show's called Ginger. <laughs> Fabulous hair. <laughs> you probably don't have to worry about it. <laughs> well, there's a group out there. I think they're on um, Facebook, maybe me, we and stuff. It's Ketotarian. So if you're interested, check it out. That's it's so funny. <laughs> I would there's, love to check that out. There's a but libertarian still, yeah, everything. <laughs> I use a ton of the recipes. I still eat really low carb. I'm just not pulling in ketosis, but I think keto is an awesome diet. Yeah, I am. I'm a fan too. So I just thought that was cool. Um, so some of your major work that you do is out about the death penalty and um, abolishing the death penalty, and then also trying to get people to understand what happens in the system. Was that something that you stumbled upon with your work or was that a passion or how did you get into that? Yeah, it was truly something that, you know, I'm a Christian and I think God just wanted me to do the work because I was not seeking it out. I was very pro death penalty, never in a million years thought I'd work on that issue. Um, I care a lot about mental health issues. I'm somebody who has a generalized anxiety disorder and I have for a long time felt really frustrated with the discourse around mental health in this country because I feel like it is um, demeaned and sort of pushed aside by people on the right and in evangelical circles. And then people on the left, like their answer is really big government. And so I wanted to learn the system a bit better and get involved to find free market solutions to mental health care issues. So while I was still in music, I started doing some pro bono work for the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI. Um, and it was through that work that I first kind of came up against the death penalty. They asked me to work on a bill that was excluding people with severe mental illness from the death penalty. And I didn't want to do it. And I was pro bono. So I could say no. And I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to work on that one for you. And I'm really pro death penalty. And, and they were shocked because they were like, <laughs> sounds you? so funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know. They were like, for people with mental illness. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like go death penalty. I think it's great. <laughs> So oh, what, what like, pivoted uh, you? Well, they, you know, they handled me well, I have to say. They were kind of like, you're the limited government person here. You hate the government. Like, what do you mean you yeah. want the government to get to kill people? It, to be honest, it was one of those issues, and I hope to never be caught in this situation again, where I had a very strongly held opinion based on absolutely nothing. Like, I had done no research on it. I, the only arguments I'd ever heard against the death penalty were sort of straw man versions of what the left might say around it. And I just had a lot of false assumptions. And so basically they, they basically applied, you know, appealed to my principles and said, maybe you need to look into this a bit more. Like, will you just read some studies? You're a numbers person, you know, look into it. And the thing about the death penalty is that the evidence against it, the arguments against it are so overwhelming that I really think anybody who took 10 minutes to look into it would be like, Ooh, probably not. Like yeah. it, it really kind of slapped me over the head. And I was, you know, I kind of had an egg on my face. I was embarrassed that I had this opinion that was 
based on just total hogwash. So I, I moved on it pretty quickly. I did end up working on that bill for them. Um, first, I just kind of became convinced we needed better protections or we needed to fix the system. And then as I got around it more and worked on it longer and longer and just came to see the full picture even more up close, I became adamantly against it. And then from there, um, a few years later, I ended up taking over conservatives concerned about the death penalty and ran that for three years before moving to where I am now, which is the Foundation for Economic Education. So I um, had a long road with the death penalty, but yeah, it, it definitely wasn't something that I necessarily saw myself doing. Um, you, you bring up an excellent point that a lot of people are just uneducated about it. Um, and when I was a conservative, I was absolutely pro death penalty. I'm like, you know, God says that, you know, this is, you know, the punishment and therefore we should install it in government and in our society, which goes down a whole other road. But, um, actually I just assumed that the system pretty much mostly had to work because for heaven's sake, somebody goes through an entire court system and, you know, a lot goes into get a death penalty verdict how could somebody end up there and be innocent? And that's actually just was a horrible assumption. Number one, I was trusting government, which is always a bad way to do. But could you speak a little bit about um, some of the people that have been on death row, been exonerated, things like that, maybe some numbers? Yeah. So, you know, when I first started doing this work, I think it was one person for every 11 executions that we had exonerated. Now, not even five years later, that number is one person exonerated for every eight executions. That's how many more innocent people we've discovered in a very brief time. Um, partly, you know, thanks to developments like DNA evidence and things mm -hmm. like that, but also just because there there's been a really great concerted effort of pro bono work like the Innocence Project and others in their sort of vein of attorneys who are coming in and doing the work to really start working through these old cases. But when I used to hear those numbers, you know, Innocence numbers, one, I had no idea it was the, the sheer weight of that number is much bigger than I would have guessed. But even when I would hear about an Innocence case on death row, to me, I thought that was proof that the system worked, right? It's catching itself, see, like it's doing things right. And in reality, now that I've been around it, I'm like, no, the system does everything it can to block a case from being overturned or an innocent person from getting out. It's really hard, even when there's overwhelming evidence to prove that someone's innocent and get them out of the system. It takes 14 years on average. Um, the, the attorneys, the judges, the police, everything in the system works to uphold the conviction. There's lots of arbitrary deadlines and filings. If you don't have a really good attentive attorney, you're going to miss being able to argue your case. They will block DNA testing of evidence. You know, I know under the election last year, there was a lot of conversation around Kamala Harris having blocked potentially exculpatory evidence while she was attorney general in California and people were kind of outraged. And I was like, yeah, you should be outraged, but you should also know there's like 10 other AGs doing this right now. Mm -hmm. Like as we speak, this is so common. And so, you know, seeing that up close really, that was enough, honestly. And I think that that should be enough. Just knowing how frequently we get it wrong, knowing how hard the system works to kill people, even when they know they're potentially innocent, it's really jaw dropping. And, and I was like you, like, I don't know why I thought that the justice system was this one exception to how government functioned and that everything in it worked great and everybody working in it was honest and and just, you know, really a, a citizen servant kind of person. I, I had all these just false perceptions that I think mostly came from Law and Order SVU about who was working the system and how it worked. And nothing could be further from the truth. And, and it really is quite galling. Um, and just to give a couple stats on it, you know, when people hear that there are these innocence numbers, They'll say, well, then we should only give people the death penalty if there's an eyewitness and only if there's, you know, beyond the shadow of doubt. And I'm like, 70% of wrongful convictions we've discovered involved eyewitness testimony. Mm -hmm. We're really, really bad at recognizing people, especially when we get the cross racial recognition test. Secondarily, DNA evidence, the misapplication of it has been involved in 45% of wrongful convictions. There is no such thing as a sure case. There is always the potential for us to get it wrong. And really all the incentives go towards getting a conviction, not towards finding the truth. Um, so I, I think that there's, it's kind of a fairy tale to think it would ever operate in another way. Uh, you brought up a really funny point. And before we take this break, I wanna uh, just, talk about the misconceptions that television and media give about the legal system. So, and the law and order thing you mentioned is, is quite funny, but we will be right back after this uh, promo from our sponsors. Well, hello, hello, my lovelies. Welcome back to Ginger Arky. I have Hannah Cox here, um, a brilliant libertarian conservative. And we were talking about the death penalty. Um, and it's funny, she mentioned something about, you know, people thinking that you could go all the way through a case and really have that smoking gun to convict somebody and put them on death row. And that pretty much only happens on TV. Um, it's funny if you ever watch a cop show or anything like that. Number one, the, the police are always just the most 
courageous, wonderful people who would never do something wrong if somebody wasn't, you know, was, wasn't looking and they're just going to, you know, work their conscience. And I'm sure there's a few people out there like that, but that's really not how it works. And that's not how unions work. Um, so could you speak a little bit about that? Like, do, do people think that that television is real life when it comes to that? Yeah. <laughs> they absolutely do. In fact, in the kind of criminal justice world, we call it the CSI effect where people truly believe that there's DNA everywhere. First and foremost, there's not. <laughs> There's only DNA evidence available in about 10% or less of cases. But I used to think that I thought, you know, there's fingerprints and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> there's not, it's not, it's not like that. Um, and then secondarily, even when there is evidence, it's often not as foolproof as they make you think it is on TV. It's not as conclusive, you know, it's a good tool. It can be something that we should use as, as a tool in the system, but it shouldn't be this like deciding factor. And we see that juries, um, you know, are very much under that perception though. when they come in, if there's DNA evidence, they are so much more likely to convict based off that alone, because they have been taught by these TV shows that this thing is infallible and that nobody would ever lie about it. And that hundred percent you can trust it. And it's really a huge problem in our system. Um, we also see that, you know, I think, uh, over deference is given to police in the system. I think mm -hmm. their testimony is trusted above others, which we also know, um, through many of them who've been caught lying under oath that it shouldn't be the case. But but yeah, those those shows have really done a lot of damage. Um, and I actually wrote an article about this a few years ago, or maybe it was last year, kind of a blur during COVID. But uh, that said why I regret my teenage crush on Elliot Stabler because I used to think he was so hot. <laughs> Oh no, oh, not yeah. iced tea. <laughs> and, um, he's just ruined for me now. I can't even watch that show anymore. Cause I'm like, this is propaganda. It's, it's yeah. so frustrating, but you know, the good thing, the good thing in, is that most Americans, despite us having such a, a humongous prison population, most Americans will never encounter the criminal justice system. And thank God for that. But it does lead people, especially people, certain socioeconomic classes and races to having a really um, just totally fairy tale view of the system and how it operates and what it's truly like. And I've even seen one of my relatives going through this recently. I have a cousin who's had some issues and they're, they're shocked at how they're being treated by the district attorney or by the police or by some of the corrupt things they're doing. And I'm like, I've been trying to tell you guys this for years, you know, but until you're impacted by it, I think it's hard for people to really start to put themselves in the shoes of others or just truly grasp the, the sheer corruption that is going on in our system, um, especially for older Americans. You know, I know my dad at one point said to me, you know, his perception of police is still kind of Andy Griffith. And that's what he grew up with, you know, was the town policeman who you knew and who really was there for people and really did offer kind of a public safety component. And that's just not where policing has gone in this country. A lot has transpired, um, really beginning with the implementation of the war on drugs in the 70s, and we've just seen it escalate from there. And so where we're at now is a very different picture. And I, th I think that many Americans have some catching up to do to really understand where we're at. So what are some of the fixes then to the system? Like, what can people do? Like, de-incentivize de the, you know, a district attorney? Um, is there, is there bills that are being put, like, what can we do? Legislation, what fixes yeah. this problem? There is no easy answer because the problem is just so massive. There's there's so much going wrong. I do think the, the best place to focus is local. That's where you can always have the most change. You know, so many people focus on the federal level and, um, you know, a lot of people are criticizing Joe Biden for not being more active on criminal justice, which we could have predicted. Yeah, but, you know, surprise. <laughs> doesn't matter as much where Joe Biden or Donald Trump is, it can have some impacts, but most people, if they're in the prison system are not at the federal level, that's a very small percentage of what we're dealing with. Most people are at the state level or in, they're in local county jails. Um, and so that's where you need to focus. I do think people have got to start watching their district attorneys. You know, this is something that's an elected position that most people pay zero attention to. It's an extremely powerful position. They usually run unopposed. They stay in office for decades. And these guys and women can be some of the most corrupt government officials you'll ever encounter. They're rarely held accountable when they are corrupt. They'll get like a slap on the wrist, but they, they really very rarely get more than that. Um, most judges are former prosecutors and district attorneys themselves. And so they've got some friends on the bench that usually are you know, more predisposition to their side. I think one thing that we could really start to work for is, you know, I want to see people who've worked for the Innocence Project run the district attorney's office. I want to mm -hmm. see people who've done defense actually on the bench and, and sitting as judges. And so when there are opportunities for us to ensure that those are the kind of people that with that kind of experience, we can try to get those people in positions of power. And, and we have seen that happening across the country. You know, we've seen a large wave of more uh, reform-minded prosecutors and judges who have been winning their elections. And, and that's encouraging to me. Um, but I also think, you know, we need to support our city council people and our state legislatures when they're trying to move criminal justice reform bills. It's really hard to pass criminal justice reform legislation, despite it being 
so freaking popular in the culture on both sides of the aisle, it's hard because the district attorneys have associations and the police have unions and associations and they come in and they lobby on your tax dollars and they spend a lot of time up there working against us and they threaten the lawmakers and they threaten to call themselves on crime or they threaten to run against them and it works and it, it frequently stops really good reforms that need to move forward because they have the time to sit up there on your tax dollar whereas you probably don't. Um, so I think it's important to give your lawmakers encouragement and I think it's important to really try to seek to hold your district attorneys and police accountable. We need far more transparency. We need to really hard, like hold their feet to the fire. Uh, you brought up a, a good point about maybe defense attorneys running, you know, for office. And I used to be under the perception, the law and order perception, that they're all the slimiest people in the world. I mean, whenever they cast those characters in those shows, the defense attorney, like 99% of the time, they're just awful people. Mm -hmm. And actually having known quite a few in my life now, and then um, having done some work here locally in uh, Cuyahoga County, as far as bail reform and jail reform and things like that, there's some of the most brilliant people that fight against the system that, uh, you know, there's some of the only people that get things done where sometimes you feel like the little guy in a way they're the little guy, but like they're the heroes. So, um, I think that's another perception of, you know, that people have that probably should be flipped on its head a little bit. hundred percent. And it's so funny. You're in Cuyahoga County in Ohio. I didn't know that yes. Cuyahoga County is a County that is, uh, emblazoned in my mind because of some issues around the death penalty and, and district attorneys there, there've been a lot of issues. So that's quite interesting. We, they're one of the high usage counties in the whole country. So yeah, there's, <laughs> there's some major issues in Cuyahoga County. Um, as far as like prosecutor down to the jail, I don't know if you know about the jail here, but in a span of a year, it was so disgusting that 12 people being held for nonviolent crimes died in the prison. One didn't get his insulin or in the jail. I mean, it's just, it's a disgusting place. Luckily there are lots of groups, um, working on jail reform, justice reform here. So I would encourage anybody, if you're in the Northeast Ohio area, you can even email me, um, you know, drop me a line, send me a message or whatever, and I can hook you up with somebody there. Um, so definitely a, something really close to my heart. And I think it's awesome that, uh, That's great. You work so on that. You work there. um, so as a libertarian lady, we'll get to the fun questions now. <laughs> do you feel like um, you get treated a little bit differently than guys, or do you pretty much feel like it's a level playing field? Um, I, don't, I always find these questions a little bit hard to answer um, because I'm not somebody who really thinks about my gender very much. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> I was just telling somebody the other week, like I, I've never had like any, any gender issues or anything. Like I'm a woman and like, I, I just, but I, I grew up in a really great environment where that wasn't something that was like, I was never taught that that was something that would hold me back. And so I probably haven't noticed if it has, like, it's just not something I think about as much. I do think um, when it comes to online interactions, like certainly I think people can be a bit more aggressive towards women online. Um, I have had to deal with interactions that as far as I know, my male counterparts haven't had to deal with with people finding my number or, or my personal information, trying to get in contact with me, like being really creepy. Um, I don't think that happens to men as much. I would like to think it doesn't, but who knows? People are crazy. Um, so I think some of that, but you know, as far as my treatment in the libertarian movement, I, I feel like as a whole, I've always been treated very well in the libertarian movement. Uh, a lot of the men who have really been at the top kind of, of the party and of the movement have always been more than welcoming to me and extended their platforms to me and, um, you know, offered me jobs and helped me make connections. And like, I really feel like I've, I've been treated very well and had great male mentors in this in this whole sector and i'm so thankful for that i do wish there were there was better female representation in the movement mm -hmm. and i think that my experience um is certainly not one that has been mir mirrored by many women i've heard many stories to the contrary which have been disheartening and upsetting and sad and um, I think there's, there's obviously work to be done to ensure that all women have a positive experience and that we live up to our values in this movement and that we truly are treating people with equality and empowerment and as individuals um, and, and honoring, you know, the non-aggression principle and people's yeah. rights as human beings. So um, certainly I see problems in the movement. I don't know that I've had the brunt of the issues though. Um, I, you have a, make an excellent point. <clears throat> and I know um, myself, I just find that when I surround myself with good um, men, you know, in the movement, and I don't have to worry about that. I think mostly it is an online thing. You know, it's very easy to type something horrible behind a keyboard um, when you don't have a professional career or life. So I always say it sounds kind of harsh, but I just don't associate with losers and I find better people. <laughs> 
when I don't do that. (laughs) I block really quickly. I don't, I don't put up with people who treat me poorly or speak poorly to me. And I don't know. I think some of it is just how you carry yourself, you know, not to in any way victim blame, but I just think I am kind of like take no crap sort of person. Mm -hmm. So if someone is rude to me or something, I, I I don't spend any time thinking about it. I just remove them and keep it moving. Yeah. For some reason, libertarians, I think have this idea that you have to put up with anybody because we're libertarian and we're, and that's kind of the opposite of like a free market or voluntary solution. You get Mm -hmm. to pick and choose who you want to be with, what you want to do, you know, and you can't push that on other people. So it's a strange phenomenon on the internet. I think that's pretty much put out there by people that nobody wants to listen to. Exactly right. It's the only people that care about blocking. Um, and anybody who's gained, you know, even 10,000 followers will quickly tell you, like, once you start to get those numbers, you have to for your mental health sake, for your productivity sake. I personally don't have time to be in stupid Twitter drama with people. Um, and, and honestly, most of the time when I'm getting attacked, it's usually coming from the very far left or the very far right. Um, I tend to mostly get along with libertarians. And the funny thing I found is that because I don't really involve myself in those fights, a lot of times people will circle back down the road and apologize and, and say, you know, I was wrong. I miscalculated. I'm sorry. I sent you this. So hold your tongue. Uh, I think that a lot comes from that and just you know, mute, block, keep it moving and, and let your work speak for itself. You're very good at the Twitters. I am horrible <laughs> at Twitter. Like I tried and I'm just like, no, thanks. I'll just go on there and look. But yeah, there's a lot of flame wars on there because probably because you can only say so much unless you're one of those people that just keeps subtweeting. <laughs> Twitter's like high school, you know, it's, it's, it really is this like insular bubble. It's, it's so funny. Cause I, I, post on a lot of platforms. And so a lot of times things will be such a big issue on Twitter and top of the conversation I'll mention on Facebook and my Facebook followers are like, what are you talking about? (laughs) They have no clue. So it's it's easy to be on Twitter and to start to feel like it's a big deal, but like, honestly, Twitter is just like this clicky little high school environment. Nobody outside Twitter cares about it. It really, I think I was reading today. I think it's only like, um, 20% 20% of voters even have ever heard of anything on Twitter that they would consider an issue about voting or something like that. It doesn't have that much sphere of influence as far as the political or, you know, world. So it really but, doesn't. And the but sometimes they're fun. Super isolated. Like it's mostly people with college degrees. It's mostly mm-hmm. people who are extra partisan, more active in politics to begin with. It's a lot of journalists. Like it's a very niche audience. And so yeah. I really like posting on Facebook. I mean, I love, don't get me wrong. I love hanging out on Twitter. I have a great time there, but Facebook, it does feel like you're really reaching a much wider swath mm-hmm. of the population. And it was fun though, to watch Donald Trump use social <laughs> media. And I'm, everybody knows I'm not a fan, but uh, that was quite amusing. I, I, that was such a strange thing to happen. What a weird world we live in. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> funny to think about some of those tweets like being just totally immoralized in our history like I've never seen a skinny person drinking diet coke a president said that it's going to be in a museum somewhere <laughs> yes. do you ever think back like if the founders if they had twitter what would they be saying you know and would like you know would they be drunk on there like <laughs> tweeting and <laughs> probably um probably. So I know you've got some obligations today so I just want to ask you a couple of questions about you you work for fee So what would be one of your favorite economists or maybe like the first one you read and you were like, oh my gosh, I love this idea and I might be a libertarian. Yeah, you know, Bastiat, I talk about him all the time. He's closest in my heart. I have many other dead men crushes, but I love him (laughs) so much. He was was my first love and he holds a special place for me because um, because he was the first book, book I was given that really kind of introduced me to free market economics and that really helped me I guess, really verbalized my ideology. I don't feel like I read it and shifted my ideology. I read it and I thought, oh, this is what I believe. This Mm -hmm. this gives me a better vocabulary to to describe where I'm at. Um, And it was a copy of the law that I was given. The interesting thing that, uh, actually, I was just talking to my boss about this at dinner last week, but uh, Fee was totally responsible for translating Bastiat into English. We didn't have the law until Fee had a translator come in. Yeah. I did not know that. I really didn't either. And I was like, oh my gosh, what a full circle (laughs) situation for me. Um, so there, there are many that I love, but I love Bastia and I, and I love him too, because, you know, this is a guy that was writing in like 1700s France and yet his writing is so accessible. You know, Mm -hmm. I remember when I was first given a copy of the book, I thought, I might struggle to get through this. It's going to be really dry and boring. It's not boring. It's a very engaging book, has great metaphors. And he just has this ability to take pretty complex economic um, and philosophical ideas and break them down to the average level. And that's something that I really hope to try to mimic in my own writing. So I'm very inspired by him. 
I, I definitely think you do. You're very accessible, easy to read, but you know what you're talking about. I think that's really important because sometimes libertarians get into this like bookworm thing where we're, it's like we're flexing like human action and human action was hard. And I listened to yeah. it on. <laughs> yes. So I, I, I think some of the most accessible stuff is great to suggest to people that are new to libertarianism. So if somebody's like, well, you know, I'm a conservative and, you know, I, I believe in free market principles, but I'm going to try something out. Like besides the law, what would you suggest to them as far as reading? Yeah, I think another great entry level book is Economics in One Listen by Henry Hazlitt. We use that a lot at Fee as well. Um, and then I also love the founder of Fee, Lawrence uh, E. Reed. He wrote a, really what's more of a short essay called I Pencil. But I Pencil is this lovely little story that basically explains capitalism through the eyes of a pencil. And it's, it's so basic, a child could read it and understand. Um, but it basically is, is explaining that, you know, not no person, not you, not I, no other person could come up with a number two pencil and produce it on their own. There is an extreme amount of labor that goes into this. And what's phenomenal under capitalism is that this happens in sort of this spontaneous combustion. Um, you know, people are, are seeking their the best life for themselves. They're finding the best way to make an income and they're going about their endeavors. But through that sort of spontaneous, selfish uh, interest that they're pursuing, they end up having all these parts that come together to build a hundred million things that we need for us to have the quality of life we enjoy in our society um, and, and for all those factors to kind of play together. And so capitalism really is just this amazing system that's absolutely phenomenal. And when you look at what it's achieved in human history without force, it, it's just really striking. And I, I love um, his ability to use that metaphor to explain it. So that's another great one for people to start with. I've heard Milton Friedman. Well, I, I sometimes rewatch it because I'm nostalgic about it, but explain the pencil, you know what I mean? And do his yeah. little speech about it too. And it's just, it's really good. It's just a really good three minute, you know, well, I just love Milton Friedman, but yeah, also um, great. <laughs> yeah. Papa Friedman. Um, it's funny. You also were talking about capitalism and, and how wonderful it is. And so many people think capitalism is something it isn't. Um, I think they look at cronyism or corporatism or what the government does and think that that's somehow capitalism. Um, if somebody was coming from the left and gave you that argument, what would you say to them? Yeah, I love talking to leftists about this because I absolutely blame the Republicans for this problem. <laughs> you know, they've been saying <laughs> that we we believe in free markets and capitalism and pushing something totally contrary to it. And so is it any surprise that people now think capitalism is something that it's not? Of course not. Uh, they're not being taught any differently in our government schools. And so um, they're being told, you know, America is a capitalist system. And so they believe that anything our government does is capitalism. And so if you really start to talk with people on the left, you'll find that it's really easy to agree about problems in our society. You know, I agree healthcare is too expensive. Mm -hmm. I agree that kids aren't getting a great education. I agree that we're not seeing wages keep up with inflation um, and really that people increasingly cannot afford the things that they want to be able to buy even when they're working really hard. I agree with you on those things, but what you're blaming for the problem is actually government intervention into the market. And you should be mad at that, right? I'm mm -hmm. mad at it too. That's not capitalism. That's an attack on capitalism. Having that basic conversation, I think opens a ton of doors because it gets us on a, a common ground of understanding where we're now we're using the same language. And, and once we're using the same language, we can then start coming up with ways that perhaps we can better address the problems that I think most of us actually agree upon and come up with solutions that will make people happy. And I, and I also think, you know, once people understand that all these problems are caused by government, they'll be less likely to want to give the government more power, more money, mm -hmm. and more ability to keep infringing on the market because you can't fix a problem with the same thing that created it. Um, and I think that that's actually not that hard to wrap your mind around, but we just need to have those conversations. We need to be better ambassadors. I often preach this. People need to know people who think differently than them, you know, and that way we're not mm -hmm. straw manning their arguments and that way we're not talking down to them. And that way we actually can have these conversations and, and gain ground. And I've found, you know, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of people on the left through my work with criminal justice reform. I really like people on the left. Um, we have different economic ideas, but I found that many of them will move kind of quickly once we can have these conversations and that because I'm friends with them and because they trust me on my work with criminal justice, they're open to having those conversations. So I think that's a bit of interpersonal work that libertarian need to be better about you mean we shouldn't just scream somebody as a status <laughs> and like throw human action at them or <laughs> yeah, also fun but <laughs> yes, probably doesn't work very well not quite as effective 
my actually my favorite um, libertarians and anarchists are people that came from the left as well. My husband was a huge liberal. I grew up a um, huge conservative, you know what I mean? And we've kind of met this way. So I enjoy somebody from a different experience just to see the way that they came to libertarianism. So just because it's something I'm not familiar with. So, all right, Hannah, what, what are you doing now that you've moved into your new home? What's next for you? And then where can people find you? Well, if anybody needs me, I will be doing a lot of manual labor around the house. (laughs) I've been working so hard. Uh, There's still a lot of work to do. So that's taking up all my spare time. Um, But I am in Atlanta. I am really loving it here already. I will be at Freedom Fest in July out in South Dakota. So I'd love to connect with people there. Um, And then they can find me at Hannah D. Cox on Twitter, uh, on Facebook. My new website is hannahdcox.com slash home. So there's lots of good places to connect with me. My show based is available on YouTube and Facebook and Spotify and iTunes and all the good places. And then a lot of my writing is at fee, F-E-E dot org. Would love for them to check out the Foundation for Economic Education. There's a lot of other good writers there as well. and, And I really just love the content they're putting out as a whole. Well, thank you so much, Hannah. By the way, we had tickets to Freedom Fest last year, which was a bummer. (laughs) That is a bummer. We ended up just having to go to Vegas because we couldn't cancel and just driving around the desert. So, (laughs) (laughs) and of course we don't this year because I'd love to meet you out there. Um, Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I will put all of your stuff in the show notes. Guys, if you don't follow Hannah, you should because she's excellent, intelligent, witty, Um, and just gives good information and lots of content too. So I will close out to this episode of Ginger Arky by saying peace, grace, love, and fuck the state.